Um, okay, I, uh, Anna actually did such an excellent job that I probably have to skip some of my slides because some of the literature <laughs> said the same, and uh, especially for the motivation of some of the variables. So thank you for that. My name is Mina Balia Um For those of you who were not here yesterday when I introduced myself, it's, I, am, I work at the University of North Florida where, where I am a full professor, but I'm taking a leave and I'm going to be a director of research at the African Center of Economic Transformation in Ghana. So hopefully I'll start on August 1st. Um, so my paper uh, has two folds. Um, there is the first part where I try to contrast or at least review briefly what happened in Mauritius and Madagascar, two uh, island economies uh, in Africa. Um, and I'm interested in these two countries because they tried, uh, for Madagascar, Madagascar tried to replicate what Mauritius did. And yet, when you look at the situation in Madagascar today, Madagascar, by most standards, is a poor country compared to Mauritius. And I'm going to go over mostly it's a story using graphs. And the second thing I do is, um, after I look at that, then I say, well, what is really very different? Uh, and if I don't want to limit myself to the institutional and policy um, um, explanations, which I do in another paper, I did in another paper, then I want to look at other things, you know, things that we can change. And, uh, and it turned out uh, that infrastructure is part of the story and, and human capital also is a big part of the story. And so building on that, I go to the second part where I do an empirical analysis of a group of African countries using variables that could affect um, some measures or proxies for or indicators for uh, industrial development. Okay, so this is... Um, a graph that shows um, the GDP per capita in purchasing power uh, parity values and um, the growth of GDP for the two countries. The um, red colored ones are for Mauritius and then the others, uh, that curve is supposed to be dark blue. So the blue ones are for, um, for um, uh, Madagascar. And as you can see, the per capita income for Mauritius <sighs> It grew very significantly over the period of 1982, um, 1981 to 2011, so the last three decades. While on the other hand, if you look at the per capita income of Madagascar, it's actually declined slightly over that period, which is a scary thing. Um, if you look at the um, GDP growth rates, Mauritius, what's really interesting here is that Mauritius has low volatility in growth rates. And Madagascar has very high volatility, although sometimes they have high growth rates, but then when it is negative growth, it's also, if you look at this, number, this uh, year here, 2002, it dips a lot. So there is volatility, there is on average lower growth compared to Mauritius, and definitely much lower per capita income. So what went wrong? And then I started looking at a few other things. So because both of them focused on exporting manufacturers, textile mostly in the beginning. I uh, compare here the value added of industry as, as a share of, um, of output and manufacturing as a share of output. And if you look at the two countries throughout uh, this period, most of it at least, um, the difference is huge between Mauritius and, and Madagascar. Again, the two red, red lines are, uh, curves are for Mauritius. Um, but what is interesting is that if you look at the period in the 70s, the late 70s period, or second half of the 70s, you see that Madagascar actually had a higher industrial value added comp than, than, um, than uh, Mauritius's uh, manufacturing value added. So it was high, but uh, it went down. So uh, I'm missing data. I cannot talk a lot about the 70s because there is no data on, ma on manufacturing value added for, for Mauritius. But the point here is that there is huge differences for, for the absolute majority of those years. Then I look at the exports of manufacturers as a share of um, uh, merchandise exports in the two countries. And again, uh, Mauritius uh, outperforms Madagascar. But if you look at the 70s, 1975, for example, 76, they were very close. The gap has increased over time. And then I use other, a few other measures for, um, although it's not really a perfect measure of, uh, of uh, diversification or diversity of products, but at least if you know that a country is exporting lots of products, chances are that some of them are not really linked to primary, uh, the primary sector, right? Um, so again, Mauritius um, outperforms um, 
Madagascar. And then I use this measure of which I call sophistication of exports. The UNCTAD has, uh, has uh, some um, data that show export dissimilarity with developed economies that, so this is, this is like Mauritius exporting only to develop, developed economies and Madagascar exporting only to developed economies. So I take those exports and I take the measure of dissimilarity. So the, the higher the measure, the more dissimilarity. The lower the measure, the less dissimilarity. And so if a country is exporting developed economies goods, then that country, his chances are they are doing more, so they have more sophistication in their exports. And what's interesting is that Mauritius actually did not have a lot of, uh, did worse in the early days, in this period here in the 90s, then Madagascar, but, um, but the dissimilarity with developed economies went down if you go to the 2000s. So the red line actually is below the blue line there. Okay, so that doesn't really give me something that's consistent throughout the period to say that Mauritius definitely has more sophistication. And then I look at high technology exports, and again you see that it, in the 2000s Mauritius exports a lot more high technology products in, in within their manufacturing exports than, than, um, than uh, uh, Madagascar did. Um, the problem with these two last measures is that they, are not, they don't give a consistent story throughout the period. And that's why I don't use measures of sophistication per se, except that I actually do still look at high technology exports, but I'm thinking of it as just parts of diversification. Um, the global competitiveness of the two countries, again, is also huge. The gap is huge there. If you look at um, both the rank and the scores of Madagascar and compare them to Mauritius, you see that there is a huge difference. Uh, things like, for example, the value chain breadth. Uh, Mad Mad uh, Mauritius is ranked 28th in the country among 144 countries that were surveyed in 2012-2013 reports. Um, you look at things, co the, the control of international distribution, 23rd in the world, but you look at Madagascar, it's 112 and 134, so it's much closer to this. This is a measure that the Global Competitiveness Report uses to see if these countries add lots of value, value to the things that they make within the country before they export them internally. Um, and, and I put the, the reference so that if you want like, to see how the calculation is made. Um, so, but, but Madagascar doesn't add a lot. Okay, so, and then I look at some selected indicators of infrastructure, and there, uh, the, the problem is that you, for some of the indicators, it's very hard to find data over a long period of time, so you just have points. Um, I took, um, like in the first one, you have the paved roads as a percentage of total roads in the country. So the first quadrant here, or uh, half over here, has Mauritius. And if you look at the, le the, the height of those uh, areas, there definitely there is no comparison between Mauritius and, uh, and Madagascar. Madagascar, everything is very low. And in Mauritius, everything is high. For example, the, 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 the density of paved roads is 98%, close to 100%. While if you look at, uh, if I compare just what I have there, which is 1990 and 2001, you look at Mauritius, it actually went down, right? Um, so the blue area there is higher than the red one, so it went down. And then mobile cellular subscriptions, although they are very imperfect, really, measure of infrastructure, if you ask me, um, they went down in 2009, but still no comparison, 31% versus 84% in Mauritius. And um, the last one, which is access to electricity, um, again, you are comparing 19% to about 100% huge difference there. So definitely there is a, a, a very significant difference in infrastructure. And in this graph here, I look at the urban population. Now the urban population, what's interesting about Mauritius is that it stayed roughly stable, okay, over that period of time, and it is uh, quite high. It's definitely <laughs> higher than the average for Africa. Um, in Madagascar, it went up significantly, but for most of that period, there is a huge gap between the two countries. Even towards the end, it's still, the gap is still important, more than 10 points. Um, I looked at human capital, just using secondary and tertiary school enrollment rates. And um, what is really interesting is that um, in, the, in 1985 and 1990, these are points for those years, 
tertiary education in Madagascar was higher, the rates were higher than in Mauritius. Okay, so this is even going to 1990. But look what's happened since then. 2000, 2000, 2005, higher, uh, higher education or tertiary education just went up a lot in, um, in, in Mauritius, while in Madagascar it stagnated. The increase in secondary enrollments also is very, not very strong in, in, um, in Madagascar, while in Mauritius it went up a lot. And so there is a huge difference there too. Okay, so building on that, I do an empirical analysis where I take um, data on uh, the variables, some of the variables that I, I was comp comp comparing the two, two countries on, and then look at their effects on six indicators of industrial development. And again, um, I mean, if you're going to tell me that these indicators are imperfect, I completely agree with you. There is not one single uh, measure that we can use and say this is industrial development in the country. So the best thing we can do is really look at the different uh, indicators and then see if they're consistent with each other or the results are consistent. So the first thing I do is that, that I look at the share of manufacturers in total merchandise exports, how it's behaved over time. Um, then I look at the share of manufacturing in output, so that's a different measure, because we're not looking specifically at exports, but we're looking at whether the country is diversifying both the production and the exports, okay? So um, they could, uh, a country could have uh, diversification in manufacturing and not, if it's a big market, they might not need to export a lot. On the other hand, if it's a small country, they might need to export more. They will have to export a lot. The, the third one is the share of industry in output, and this is very, um, uh, it's a very um, controversial measure if you are looking at uh, uh, natural resource rich countries. Why? Because lots of the industry can be linked to natural resources, in which case they might not be really diversifying or doing any manufacturing. It's just natural resources and then they build an industrial sector connected to that and, uh, and then they take it from there. But, but nonetheless, I look at it. And then uh, the fourth one is the share of high technology products in total manufacturing exports. And I'm using it here not as really sophistication, but just if you are doing some of that, then at least you are doing some of little bit of manufacturing or diversification. And uh, the, four, the fifth is a normalized Hirschman index of export product concentration. So I look only at the, UNICTAD has these uh, neat data that look at these things, but they're detailed. So I look only at the export side and then see if those exports are concentrated in a limited number of products or, or more. So the, the higher um, it is that index, the more concentration the country has in a few products. And then the fourth one is the number of products exported, which I used uh, earlier. And again, it's not a very perfect measure of, uh, of diversification, but the chances are if you are exporting lots of different products that you are doing a little bit uh, things that are more than just your uh, primary sector. Uh, linked to your primary sector. And then on the right hand variables, I use urbanization and Anna talked about agglomeration and, and the, the big cities and so on. So I am using that thinking. There is no telling whether urbanization as a measure of agglomeration will really have um, a positive or, or negative effects on manufacturing for the, the reason that Anna explained and I'm gonna go over a couple of them. Then I use as a measure of infrastructure, the electric power consumption per capita. If you were in yesterday's, um, uh, the first uh, plenary we had, there was lots of talk about uh, 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 electric power. And as a matter of fact, Professor Ndulu was saying power, 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 right? Okay, so uh, I have another reason why I'm using that and I'm gonna tell you in a second. Um, uh, Besides uh, the fact that also roads, paved roads, the data are so terrible that there is no way you can do anything with panel data using that. And then I use for a measure of human capital for all the stuff we have in the literature about the role of human capital and the skills in developing a diversified economy. I use a measure of human capital that is secondary um, education or enrollments for most of the measures. And then when I look at the um, export of high technology products, we want to look at tertiary education or, or en enrollments rather. I um, also look at natural resource rent for a simple reason. Natural resource rent is an important thing to look at when you are doing African countries especially because of the role natural resources play. You know, you heard a lot and you read a lot about the possibility of a natural resource curse in these countries, in most countries. Um, but I use it also for another reason and that's, that's the one also that Anna touched upon is that natural resource rent might actually lead to 
development of big cities or high urbanization without any diversification or structural change taking place. And uh, I control for FDI because manufacturing in some countries was um, based on export oriented FDI. So foreign direct investment goes to those countries from multinationals, foreign multinationals, to build the sector from which they export. I mean, uh, China, for example, did go through that in, at least in the early days. Oh, this is going fast. And then I include also trade with developed countries. I have a paper that I published in the Review of uh, African, De uh, African Development. Um, I can't remember, I think 2011 or so, that I titled destination, uh, development or growth by destination, where I showed that if you export to certain countries, you might gain from that or uh, versus exporting to other countries. But here I look at both import and export to developed countries. Okay, here is the reason why I used the electric power. Because for this conference to show really the industrial development, we're looking at um, electricity and electric power. Another reason, another thing is for urbanization. This is the map of urbanization in Africa. And the two lighter colors uh, are for the countries where there is very low urbanization. Um, and, and you can see most of Africa is really very low. But you have the high urbanization happening. And I'm, when I looked at this map, but before I came to the session, it just gave me another idea. I forgot to uh, include this in my paper, but I'm going to do it in the empirical section, is control for the location on the Mediterranean and the Atlantic Ocean. If you see that most of those with darker colors are really around the Mediterranean area, North Africa most uh, essentially, and then West Africa and South Africa down there. With the, uh, so, so the ocean effect might be strong. So I'm not going to go over every single count, so don't worry. But just to give you an, an idea of, uh, of how many equations they did. So for every single indicator, I, did, I tried all these things, and I looked at the interactions and so on. And uh, one important inter interaction that I looked at is the interaction between infrastructure and urbanization. If you go to some of the African cities today, um, they are big, right? You have these nice buildings. I, I was in, uh, I go to Accra a lot, so, and I see all these nice buildings and nice things and everything, and they're trying their best for infrastructure. Actually, the roads now are slightly better, but there is a lot missing in terms of infrastructure. So you can have urbanization without infrastructure going hand in hand with it, and that can cause problems. So I'm looking at the interplay of infrastructure and uh, electricity and urbanization. And the second one going to the, 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 the work of uh, Golan and, uh, and co-authors is this effect from natural, uh, or actually the other paper, from natural um, resources, rent, on and urbanization. So I'm looking at the interplay or the interaction between urbanization and natural resource rent to see if it's going to have a negative or positive effect. So anyway, so from this, I'm going to just talk about the results because I'm running out of time. What I find is this. Overall, for the most of these indicators, urbanization has a definite independent positive effect or a positive independent effect when it's just alone. Positive effect, so that's agglomeration is good. Um, I also find that uh, infrastructure has a positive effect. The problem is that in some of these variable, uh, these uh, estimations, the interaction between infrastructure and urbanization has a ne negative impact. And I explain that by the fact that infrastructure has not been going at the pace of urbanization. And so you get lots of problems. Um, the other thing is, again, I find in some of the estimations that there is a negative effect from the interaction of uh, resource rent and urbanization. Uh, what we were talking about earlier, which is also a bad thing for Africa. And then the third thing, and uh, equally important, is I don't find that uh, human capital is, uh, makes a contribution, a positive contribution or a negative, in three indicators. It only has a contribution in to high, um, high uh, technology exports, so tertiary education is, has a positive significant effect. And then for concentration measures, so when I use the last two concentration measures, concentration and number of products, there is a positive effect that's good. But not for manufacturing share in output, industry share in output, or manufacturing export. Now, this does not mean that, uh, that uh, human capital is not important, actually. Human capital does not appear to make a significant direct contribution to the 
to, the, to these three variables that I, uh, indicators that I listed, but that might mean that the skills that are needed that go with education are not there. Because if you look at uh, secondary enrollments, they're going up for up the absolute majority of countries in Africa, and significantly for that matter, but it's not working. What it means is that um, this might reflect the low quality of skills that are supplied in the labor market and that education is not generating the appropriate type of input that we need for manufacturing. And he used that as one of the, or I qualified that as one of the reasons why Africa on average is, appears to be taken one step um, forward and two steps back. And the second uh, reason for, for that title is this negative effect from, from um, uh, the interplay or the interaction between electricity and um, or infrastructure and urbanization. Just one last thing that I'm going to do, I'm going to stop, I promise. I give two examples here of Ethiopia and uh, Gabon. Ethiopia has one of the lowest rates of urbanization. The country with the lowest rate is Burundi, but I don't have data for Burundi, so Ethiopia is the second lowest. And if I use the interaction to model it to find the critical point, because I find uh, there is a threshold for electricity to work, I find that at current rates now, because urbanization is 16.8%, then um, the level, the threshold level from which electricity you should have, would start having, or infrastructure have positive effect, means that Ethiopia should move from 54.3 kilowatt per hour to 80 kilowatt per hour. That's not a problem. Given the urbanization, if it doesn't change urbanization, if you look at Gabon, which were the country that has the highest urbanization rate in Africa, and in 2010 it was 85.8, now it's over 86. Um, Gabon now has f four, uh, now needs 4,070 kilowatt per hour in electricity, but it only has 1,004, which means that Gabon has actually a lot more job to do, even though Gabon we know that has more urbanization and everything. So that interaction is very important, and I'm going to build another paper around that. Thank you. Sorry I went a little bit over. Thank you.